Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel, and we will begin with 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I would uh, like to ask uh, the Minister of Finance and Personnel um, if he's in any recent discussions with the National Assets Management Agency, better known as, as NAMA, and uh, if there's any plans for disposal of assets in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for his uh, question. I had a very recent discussion with uh, the Chairman of uh, NAMA, along with uh, members of the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee. We met in Parliament Buildings actually last Monday. Uh, it was my first meeting with Mr Daly in my capacity as Finance Minister, and it was a very, very useful meeting um, because of the extent of assets, Mr Deputy Speaker, which um, uh, NAMA have in Northern Ireland, the nominal value of the assets that they have in Northern Ireland is around three and a half billion pounds. They have been, as the member will be aware, selling assets off as they become viable to sell them off. Uh, one of the things that they stressed to me, and obviously we were all very, very concerned at the creation of NAMA. My, my predecessor in, in this post uh, very assiduously worked with his counterpart, the late Brian Lennon, who was finance minister in the Irish Republic at that time to ensure that the fears that many of us had that there could be a fire sale of assets in Northern Ireland didn't materialise because obviously we are very concerned about that happening. What NAMA were keen to point out is not only has there not been a fire sale but through the ability to lend to developers uh, for viable propositions they have put in some £140 million worth of money into the local economy and that has seen various developments go forward um, including a housing development for 90 units in Dundonald in East Belfast and some significant commercial property in the centre of Be uh, Belfast as well. Could I just remind uh, Mr Elliott, the Speaker, I think yesterday drew attention to the, the Times uh, overlapping or, or infringing on uh, oral questions that are already down, so we would be listening obviously very carefully to your supplementary, having drawn attention to that. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I suppose I, I didn't realise there was an overlap if there was one, but sorry, apologies for that if there was. But does the Minister consider it uh, likely that uh, the Ulster Bank could, could be part of, uh, ex partly exchanged for British loans and investments currently owned by NAMA, and if there were any likely implications for Northern Ireland in that? It may well be a, a tad of an overlap in that respect. Um, the, I, I, don't think, I don't think that is a likely uh, option, not least because having met with my, my counterpart in the Irish Republic, uh, Michael Noonan, uh, this issue has been raised and I don't get any sense of longing for a, such a swap as the, the member has described. Obviously the future of, of Ulster Bank is something that we are very closely monitoring, not least because of its significant size in Northern Ireland. It is our biggest lending uh, bank in Northern Ireland, despite its problems, despite the issues that it currently has and is still dealing with. It has a 30 plus percent share of the market in Northern Ireland because it is the only bank that we have that is uh, nationally owned at the UK level. It is frequently, Deputy Speaker, the only one that avails of various national lending initiatives. So Ulster Bank, for all of its travails, for all of the difficulties that it has faced and continues to face, is obviously something that, that we are concerned about its future. We want to see it operating in Northern Ireland as a properly functioning bank. It is, in is incredibly critical to our economy that Ulster Bank does function properly and it is able to get loans out to businesses um, so that they can start to grow and start to employ people in Northern Ireland. Inform members that uh, the member listed uh, for question number four has withdrawn her name within the appropriate time frame. And I call Mr. Kaho Ohoisin. Uh, the brief last can Could I ask the Minister, uh, I know that it is agreed the possibilities of the devolving of DVA functions uh, to the Executive in conjunction with the uh, Minister for the Environment, and I know that he recognises the importance of 300 jobs plus the attendant jobs in Korean. Could I ask him what he has done to advance this issue, uh, uh, more than just lobbying uh, London Ministers? Right. At the, the outset, I just want to clarify that... Um, Vehicle licensing and registration is a reserved matter and it is not devolved to the Assembly as we know. Um, to date I have had no discussions with the, the Minister, um, although it has been an issue that has been discussed um, at executive level. Um, I know that the, the Minister of the Environment is followed on from his predecessor in that post and trying to lobby for and argue the, 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 the argument that 
what the 300 plus staff in Coleraine do is a vital part of the entire DVA operation for the, the whole of the United Kingdom and whatever happens with uh, a move towards more online processing or online, online processing of car tax, um, that there is still a role for those staff in Coleraine to play. For supplementary. Um, could I ask the Minister, will he assure the House that he will perhaps uh, take a look at uh, consulting with uh, the unions there, the workforce, and indeed perhaps with uh, Corey and Borough Council? Well, I, I, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm content that the, the Minister of the Environment, who has obviously greater policy oversight in this area than I do, it doesn't mean, just because I don't have uh, direct responsibility doesn't mean that I can share his concerns, the members' concerns, or indeed any uh, representative from that area, or indeed right across Northern Ireland, for the future of that function that is performed at uh, Coleraine. I do think, though, as an issue in terms of taking it forward, the Minister of the Environment is better placed to do that. He has, as I know, um, um, set up meetings with the relevant transport minister, which I think is Mr Stephen Hammond, um, uh, to deal with this issue. I think it is an issue that is better pursued on a one-to-one -one level by him, but obviously with the support of myself uh, and other executive colleagues. Thank you. I call Mr Lord, I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister to outline the issues discussed at the first meeting of the Joint Ministerial Banking uh, Task Force on Banking, please? I thank uh, Deputy Speaker the Member for, for raising this issue. It is a very, very important issue and follows on from some of the points that Mr, Mr. Elliott raised. We, uh, myself uh, and Arlene Foster, the Minister for Enterprise, represent Northern Ireland on the Joint Ministerial Task Force, which was created uh, out of the Economic Pact agreed by the Prime Minister and the First and Deputy First Minister back in, in June. Uh, and I think it is one of the most significant aspects of that pact because, uh, as we all know, and the member will know from his own constituency experience, the inability of good businesses to get the finance that they need to grow is inhibiting our ability to recover uh, as an economy. So the fact that that task force has been created is a, an acceptance and an acknowledgement at a national government level that there is a particular problem here in Northern Ireland which is often very distinct from banking issues which affect um, Great Britain. Um, at that meeting that we had, we had a, uh, a broad-ranging discussion on about six issues. Uh, we discussed the strategic importance of making progress on access to finance to economic recovery in Northern Ireland. We discussed the very different structure of banking that we have in Northern Ireland, where there is less penetration by the, the big five banks, as they would describe them in Great Britain. We talked about legacy issues, primarily the property overhang that many businesses here in Northern Ireland experience. Uh, we also talked about the issue that Mr. Uh, Elliot raised, which is the future of Ulster Bank, and particularly in the context of the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards. Uh, we looked at uh, national lending initiatives and their operation in Northern Ireland. And finally, we discussed um, how we could improve the data sets that we, as an executive, receive to inform us better about what lending is going on out there in the uh, community. And I call Lord Morrow. Uh, well, can I thank the Minister for his fairly comprehensive and, and detailed reply? Uh, can I ask the Minister further, how can national lending uh, initiatives become more effective here in Northern Ireland? Yeah, that was one of the, the key issues that we did discuss and discussed at length at the, the first meeting of the, the task force. Um, uh, and it was, it was raised specifically because myself and my colleague Arlene Foster have been concerned for some time that national lend lending initiatives, which have been rolled out to much fanfare um, in Great Britain for the whole of the United Kingdom, haven't operated properly or at all, in fact, here in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think there are, there are two principal reasons for that. One is the different banking structure that we have. So whenever they are unveiling these sorts of initiatives in Great Britain and enforcing them on the big five banks. Only one of those big five banks, um, Ulster Bank, through its uh, ownership by RBS, is operating in Northern Ireland. And many, uh, the second reason is many of those um, solutions aren't tailored to the Northern Ireland problem, which is very much that issue of having a, a property overhang. So, you know, it is not so much an issue of price, which is where many of the initiatives at a national level have been focused on about reducing the price of lending. It has been about the availability uh, of lending here in Northern Ireland and, and the issue of risk inherent within that. I was very encouraged by the discussion that we did have because we looked at um, how we might be able to tailor some of those initiatives for Northern Ireland. Some of the, the thresholds and entry levels have been far, far too high for the economy that we have in Northern Ireland, where most of our businesses are obviously, as we know, uh, small to medium sized. So the, the very high thresholds have been putting off banks getting involved in, in, in schemes 
um, such as funding for lending, such as enterprise finance guarantee scheme. It is our belief as an executive that those schemes can be tailored for the Northern Ireland environment. Um, we have received a very positive response by Treasury and the Business Department that there may be scope for tailoring some of those funds and channeling through existing funds like the growth loan fund administered by Invest Northern Ireland so that we can get that funding into the economy here in Northern Ireland and out to businesses who so badly need it. Thank you. Mr Stephen Moutry. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to update us on the operation of the Help to Buy scheme in Northern Ireland? Well, the Help to Buy scheme is another one of these sort of national uh, initiatives to, in this case, to try to get the mortgage market going. Um, the Help to Buy Mortgage Guarantee Scheme is now available right across the United Kingdom and has been taken up by quite a few of the, the big high street uh, banks, the, um, the likes of RBS, uh, although not the Ulster Bank, although I understand they are considering it, uh, and Lloyds have availed of it, uh, Halifax as well, who obviously lend, lend in Northern Ireland, and, and recently in the last week, Barclays Bank have also joined the scheme. Uh, I think I, I saw a report yesterday that I think only the nationwide are the only big mortgage lender um, in, the, in, in Great Britain who are not now part of the Help to Buy Mortgage Guarantee Scheme. Um, the, it is a, an attractive scheme in that the government will guarantee up to 15% of um, a property, meaning that only 5% of a, mor a mortgage uh, deposit is required from those who might want to get onto the, the property ladder. Um, I think this scheme, on top of our very highly successful and now exceptionally well-funded co-ownership scheme, I think does have potential to assist in the recovery of the ho housing market in Northern Ireland. Um, and whilst there has been some criticism of the scheme at a national level because of the fear that it might overheat the housing market in London and the South East, I think most of us here would accept that we would, we, would, we would take any sort of heat in our housing market in certain parts of Northern Ireland. Mr Mudry for supplementary. Uh, thank you, and I thank the Minister for the response. And can I further ask the Minister, will he work with both DSD and the banks to encourage participation in the schemes? Uh, absolutely. Um, we, um, <coughs> myself and uh, my colleague in DSD, the, uh, Mr Nelson McCausen, are planning in the not too distant future to meet with local banks to discuss how Help to Buy in concert with the likes of the co-ownership scheme might be able to offer some assistance to the housing market and the recovery of the housing market in Northern Ireland. I think it's important that he and I meet with them to show our support as a government for the scheme, um, to ask them, uh, in, in, in some ways, allied to the question Lord Morrow asked, how, if there are particular reasons why they are not getting involved in Northern Ireland, um, we could iron those problems out um, with the uh, government in Westminster through the Joint Ministerial Task Force, because I think it is, it is important just in the way it has been with, say, the Enterprise Finance Guarantee Scheme for Business, if there is a scheme which has the potential to help um, people in Northern Ireland get onto the property market and start to get the housing market moving, it would be a shame if that scheme, which is operating and functioning already in mainland Great Britain, isn't operating in Northern Ireland because local banks aren't joining it. So if there's anything that I can do, if there's anything that Nelson McCausland do, can do, if there's anything that this executive can do to encourage local banks to get involved in this, or even to use it as an opportunity to highlight the products that they already have, which are encouraging people to get onto the property ladder, well, I think that's a, a useful use of our time. I call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how the Agri-Food Loan Scheme will work? Well, the, um, the scheme that the, the member refers to is a scheme that was launched um, just at the start of this month by myself and the Enterprise Minister, which is seeking to avail of a major opportunity that we believe is there for uh, local food processors and local food producers. The um, horse meat scandal that we were all only too familiar with um, in recent times has seen large supermarkets want to go back to sourcing their uh, meat products from, from the UK. And obviously that then there is a there is a gap in the market potentially there for suppliers to get into. So Deputy Speaker, we, we, we identifying that in con in conjunction with the industry itself, um, identified that as a as a an area of opportunity. But the problem was that, that farmers who wanted to build more chicken houses or um, accommodation for pigs and pol and poultry and so forth didn't have the ability to access the finance that they required and were being asked to do so at very, very high levels of security. So the scheme that we have brought forward, which is in conjunction with banks to the extent where people will only have to operate one application form um, when they go in. There won't be multiple application forms, one for government and one for the banks. Um, that we will work with those banks then to, to lend money 
on commercial t terms at a, uh, with the government uh, money being subordinated to the bank's money, but with also significantly with lower security. So it allows those farmers then to seize the opportunity, and it's being rolled out initially in the poultry sector. And we have um, committed £10 million in the first phase with a commitment to give more money to the scheme as it uh, develops. And that's the end of, of uh, the period for topical questions. So we must now move on to those oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. And I call Mr Chris Little. Question number one. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for his question. The Peace 3 programme and associated funding has a specific focus on reconciling communities and contributing towards a shared society. By the end of September 2013, the programme had attained expenditure of €193.7 million, Euros contributing towards that goal. The programme has funded a wide range of projects, including large-scale capital developments, with the creation of new shared spaces as their priority. Such projects aim to tackle the separation of communities by encouraging the development of physical environments not marked out as a territory of one side of the community. Uh, it has also enabled local authority-led uh, peace partnerships through peace and reconciliation action plans to support initiatives at a local level in conflict resolution and challenging sectarianism and racism. Through the Consortium of the Community Relations Council and POBOL, funding has been awarded to 94 projects with the aim of acknowledging and dealing with the past. Beneficiaries of and participants in the peace programme have been surveyed and have been found to be more likely to engage in contact with the other community as neighbours, friends and work colleagues are more likely to trust the other community. By building cross-community trust, um, the Peace 3 programme helps to lay foundations for stability and thereby for political and economic progress and a shared future. However, it is, and I'm sure the member would agree, incumbent on us all to work towards that goal. Chris Little for supplement. Thank the, member, or the Minister for his uh, answer, and I certainly do agree with him that uh, whilst the European peace and reconciliation work has been hugely beneficial to building a shared future in Northern Ireland, we in this Assembly and the Northern Ireland Executive do need to take leadership of that issue. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, that the EU Peace and Reconciliation Programme 4 prioritises delivery of shared services and indeed a welcome that he has made a priority of delivering innovative and efficient public services. Can I ask him, therefore, given that the Deloitte report in 2007 found that a one billion cost per year to delivering segregated services, what policies will he put in place to ensure government departments prioritise shared services over segregated? Well, you know, there, I think everybody would acknowledge that there is a lot of money that is spent in Northern Ireland that um, is spent on providing services for two sides of the community, and that in a time where you have um, straightened public finances, that isn't the best use of those finances. Um, but equally, I'm sure the member, Deputy Speaker, would agree that if it were a matter of us, you know, just laying out everything that we would desire and it being just a matter of clicking our fingers and making all of that division disappear, we would do that. But it's not, and I think the member knows and would acknowledge that it is significantly more difficult than doing that. Um, I'm not entirely sure how a rollout of shared services, for example, uh, would uh, completely and strictly um, lead us in the direction of. Uh, shared services in the way, sorry, that DFP administers in terms of shared IT or uh, shared use of EHR facilities within the civil service or broad public sector would get over some of the divisions that are sometimes it's difficult to get over the divisions inside the public sector uh, within silo uh, silos within departments, never mind um, within society in Northern Ireland. But if there is anything, I, I mean, I'm, I'm exceptionally open, as I know colleagues in the executive are, to, to looking at anything. And I think we have backed that up through our commitment through the peace funding and uh, match funding that has been provided by departments. I think we have done that through the Together Building a, a United Community uh, document, which has some very ambitious plans and targets for trying to bring our community together, but always recognising that this is not as easy a process as any of us would want it to be. Mr Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for his answer. I uh, just want to know what work has been done with the uh, Protestant Unionist and Loyalist community to encourage uptake of Peace 3 uh, funding opportunities. Thank the Member, Mr Deputy Speaker, for, for his question. And, and this has been a, a criticism I am well aware of the uh, peace programmes in the past and remains actually a criticism of the peace programme that funding to what might be provided are not 
Protestant or Catholic projects as such, um, whilst uh, there is no uh, delineation of funding between one community and another, there has certainly been, and there is uh, evidence that there has not been enough uh, or an equity of funding towards the Protestant community. Um, SEUPB have been instructed to engage with the Protestant community to encourage applications and a significant amount of time and resources on their behalf has been uh, invested in encouraging greater involvement, encouraging more applications and I think most importantly developing the capacity to make those applications uh, from the Protestant Unionist and, and Loyalist community. Um, I think we have seen some increase, although only marginal, from piece one to piece three, about 2% of an increase in uptake. It's still not enough. It's not where it should be. I want to see it higher. I want to see SEUPB continue that engagement that they have already started, which has borne some fruit, but I want to see them, them do a lot more of that. Uh, they have already carried out extensive outreach work, and it has produced in terms of bringing forward better, bigger, um, more fundable projects from the broad com Protestant community, and I would just highlight two of them. One of them is, is Skenos, not too far away from here, on the Newton Arge Road, which uh, is a project, a, a community project, which is valued at £6 million for, for that community and is doing a fine job. Uh, and the other one is the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland's Reach um, project, which has a value of £3.6 million. So you can see that there have been more significant projects coming from, forward from the Protestant Unionist and Loyalist community to avail of that peace funding, which is every bit as much theirs as, as, as it is anybody else's. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and I call him Sir Dominic Bradley. Um, I was going to Ragra. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Sorry for popping up earlier. <laughs> I'm a better timekeeper than, uh, than I realise, but in any case, uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, and the Minister will recall that. A number uh, of groups in receipt of peace monies had their letters of office uh, of offer withdrawn. Could the minister tell us um, will that money uh, now be repayable to uh, Europe by the groups involved, or will it be a charge on the public purse? It's a fairly cryptic mm. question from the member. Um, Without knowing precisely what groups he is talking about, what projects he is talking about, it's very hard for me to answer what will happen to the money um, that he is speaking about. So perhaps if he wants to, maybe afterwards, or in correspondence, raise particular issues with me, I'm sure that I can give him the answer that he's looking for. I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, could he perhaps detail how applications to Piece 3 are classified, if indeed they are classified, to monitor and ensure that funding is dispersed proportionately and fairly across community, cross community, and other sectoral interests? Yeah, it is. It is. It isn't as easy, uh, Deputy Speaker, as as uh, you might think to say. Well, that's a, a project that belongs to one community or another community, and I, I'm aware of uh, certain, particularly on you know capital infrastructure projects, where the the project would serve both sides of the community, but it is classified as being part of one side of the community or another because that is where you know the, the predominant community in that area is one side of the community or another. So I'm thinking particularly of the, the Peace Bridge in uh, Londonderry, which um, while serving both sides of uh, that community, um, because it was physically located in the Derry City Council area, and that is predominantly Roman Catholic, it scores then as being Roman Catholic. Um, that then, that's why it's, why it's hard to actually pinpoint this and make this as, as, obviously there are some projects which are much clearer to identify than others. Um, but there is a difficulty, particularly on the capital infrastructure side, of saying that's a Protestant uh, project and that's a Catholic project, uh, and therefore it's, it's, it's not that we should avoid this, and that there's clearly a problem in terms of a lack of uptake, and the member will know this certainly in the, in, 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 um, the likes of Belfast, in applying at all for this, never mind applying and not succeeding. So that's where I think it, it is useful that we monitor the figures and that we keep on top of the figures because it allows us to identify where there might be problems and it allows us then to target our resources as we have done through the extensive work uh, and outreach work that SEUPP has done. But the member is right to, to identify that it isn't just as simple as saying that belongs to one side and that belongs to another because, as we know, various projects are, oh, projects are by their nature open to everybody, especially on the, the capital side of things. 
If members would note that question 13 has been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Ian Mill. Good. Uh, people ask on Collier. Cast a redo. Question number two. Thank you, Member, for his question, Deputy Speaker. Uh, public procurements above £5 million pounds are subject to the Public Contracts Regulations 2006 and the European Union Directive on Public Procurement. This legislation permits award of public contracts on the basis of lowest price or most economically advantageous tender, both of which incorporate quality considerations. In the procurement of public projects of £5 million pounds and above, various aspects of quality may be measured through the following approaches. At the selection stage, through an assessment of the quality of those firms seeking to tender in terms of the resources and technical ability that they possess, and at the award stage through the specification and contract requirements which require adherence to standards or performance measures and or evaluation of bids against specific quality criteria. Mr Mullen for a supplementary. Good morning, uh, I would like to thank the Minister for his answer uh, thus far. Um, I hear what the Minister is saying, but there are concerns um, within the construction industry that uh, these projects are based 100% on price, as DFP have changed uh, the criteria. So therefore, does he not agree that there is a significant risk to uh, getting public value when, remove, when you remove public or quality, quality from procurement criteria? Let me speak. I, I, can un- I understand the, the point that the member is making, and I think it is, um, I suppose, an understandable concern that some might have. The, the policy change, that ha- which is permissible under the law, was introduced uh, through the publication of procurement guidance, um, procure- a procurement guidance note in May of 2012. Prior to the introduction of the policy, there was full consultation with the construction industry, and the guidance was presented to the construction industry forum for Northern Ireland. And I think the, the, the problem here develops. So I make that I make that point to emphasise to the member this wasn't something that was landed on the construction industry without their um, without their involvement, without their consultation. In fact, we looked at the policy note and the change to policy in direct response to representations that have been made to the Central Procurement Directorate from many within the construction industry. And the concerns that they had was that because quality was now so um, integral within um, bidding for contracts that everybody was doing it so well that it was very, very hard to distinguish between the quality of one bid or another bid. And that in some instances above a certain threshold, like the EU threshold is actually um, it's, it's roughly uh, £4.3 million uh, pounds the way it works out on, on um, currency fluctuations. So cur- ones above that were were allowed to be let on the basis of lowest price. And for some within the construction industry and the majority of people who responded to it, they could see the advantages because there wasn't much difference on the bid, on, in terms of the bids, in terms of the quality that was being put forward. Um, the quality aspects, as I've outlined, can still be put into contracts at specification stage. And, and also what many small firms, and of course we all have a particular interest in ensuring that whilst we can't manipulate the rules and break the rules, but that small firms have good access to contracts, some were finding that having all of this sort of slew of, of, of quality uh, measures was actually making it incredibly difficult for small and medium-sized firms to bid for contracts at all. Thank you. Mr Sidney Anderson for... Thank you, Principal De- Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Minister, can you tell us, well, you have talked uh, a lot there about uh, quality, but how is quality actually measured in a lowest price contract? Well, I think it's a, it's a useful question to, to clarify in the context of Mr Milne's question, that you know, just because a, uh, a tender goes towards lowest, being, being let on lowest price doesn't mean that we've sort of thrown the whole idea of having a good, high quality uh, contract out the window. In fact, quite the opposite. Quality is still insured, but it is insured at a different stage where a contract is awarded on the basis of lowest price, Deputy Speaker. Quality is now and will be addressed by specifying standards which must be met at various stages throughout the delivery of a contract. So it isn't a matter of, of quality being cast aside and abandoned. We still want quality, but it is, is done in a different way. And of course, the, this will depend on whether you know, different copes. We have several different copes in Northern Ireland, and they will they will look at this policy and, and adapt this policy as they see fit for the contracts that they have. Good, Mr. Patsy McGlone. 
Gurma, I got a free last young Colia, I guess Moe has slash and Iras and a Fragri Gunigisha. Thanks very much, Mr. Prim- Principal Deputy Speaker, and my uh, thanks to the Minister for his answers on this, this topic to date. Uh, can the Minister give us some examples or some details around good practice procurement, which in actual fact has delivered on social clauses? Thank you. Yeah, well, look, the, I, the member will be, will be well aware that social clauses, is, there's actually a, a programme for government commitment to include social causes in, in all contracts. Now, that, that, is, that has proven challenging because there are some contracts, particularly supply contracts, which are difficult to let um, on the basis of having social clauses in the way that we might understand or traditionally have understood what social clauses entail, which is things like um, bringing on apprentices or long-term unemployed. By their very nature, it's less easy to do that type of social clause than it is on a construction contract where you obviously are uh, you do, Deputy Speaker, have the uh, uh, available, uh, possibility of bringing on uh, apprentices and employing some people from the local area who are uh, long-term unemployed people. Um, so it's, it, this has been this is being currently being shaped, and as a member will know, it's social considerations and clauses have to be incorporated into public procurement processes and contracts, either by linking them to the subject matter of the contract or by using them in, in contract performance clauses. And in some respects, and there's one school of thought which suggests that all contracts have social elements in them because we have equality considerations in them, we have health and safety considerations in them, and we're now increasingly putting in prompt payment considerations into contracts as well. So all of those have a, a clear social benefit, but where possible, and, 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 and in fact right across all contracts, Departments are now trying to let them so that they have social clauses as well. But as we develop this policy, we will develop different, and we need some broader thinking about what what those mean in terms of how can you, you know, so we're not just pigeonholed into having just apprentices or just employing long-term uh, unemployed people. There need to be some other social and community benefit clauses that we need to be looking at and examining that we can incorporate into contract. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, uh, I wonder if the Minister um, content that work carried out by bodies working under central procurement can be sure that the contracts, and I'm thinking here of quality and value for money, that those contracts will satisfy the Northern Ireland Audit Office or indeed any other form of audit? Well, I'm not entirely sure what the point the member is getting at, because you know, we are very, some would say that we are overly strict in how we administer contracts so that we don't fall foul of any audit or whether that be from the Northern Ireland Audit Office or, or anyone else. Obviously there was an Audit Office um, report recently on collaborative procurement which the, the Department is taking forward um, and welcomes in fact the recommendations that were included within that report and are taking those forward so that particularly we ensure value for money in delivering um, those um, softer services that sometimes can be e- more easily procured across departments. Sir Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, Member Deputy Speaker, for his question. The Budget Exchange Scheme is an agreement between the devolved administrations and, and Her Majesty's Treasury that allows the carry forward of unspent public expenditure from one year to the next up to a specif- specified limit. At present, these limits allow for the carry forward of 0.6% of that year's resource departmental expenditure limit and 1.5% of capital departmental expenditure limits. In practice, this means that the Northern Ireland Executive can carry approximately £55 million of Ardell and £12 million pounds worth of capital Dell from one year into the next. There is an additional complication this year, however, in that the devolved administrations have been allocated additional amounts of financial transactions capital, which must be allocated to private sector entities. Because of this complexity, it is more difficult to allocate within a year. I am currently in discussions with Her Majesty's Treasury on the possibility of setting up some form of ring fence budget exchange scheme treatment for this financial transactions capital that will allow the Executive to fully allocate this spend in Northern Ireland. Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his, res- his response. But can the Minister advise what the additional flexibilities he refers to are? And does he anticipate that all of the financial transactions capital funding allocated to the Executive will be spent? Thank the Member for, for his question. Uh, yeah, I've been in, in discussions, as I said, with Her Majesty's Treasury on um, separate budget exchange scheme arrangements for financial transactions capital 
Uh, and under these proposed arrangements, we would be able to carry forward a larger proportion of this new financial transactions capital into the first year without reducing then into the sec second year. And the reason we have done that is so that we can achieve the, the second part of the member's question, which is the, that we can get it all spent. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty in getting it all spent in the first year, it's about uh, 45 million in the first year, closer to 60 in the second year, and the third year is up to 100. So you can see that this expenditure is ramping up over the next number of years. But because it is new, because it requires us to deal directly, Deputy Speaker, with the private sector, it is slightly more complicated for departments to do this sort of work than might be sort of conventional capital and waiting for five or ten or fifteen million pounds to come forward conventionally and get that spent um, fairly easily. This requires partnership with the private sector. I mentioned earlier in response to um, Mrs. Bradley's question about the Agri Food Loan Scheme, which myself and the Minister of Enterprise have recently launched. That is a very good example of the use of that, that financial transactions capital, where we give that out to private sector, in this case it's actually directly to the farmers themselves, so that they can develop their business. And there are also other money has already gone to the housing sector to allow them to develop, again, to help that ailing sector. But it is incumbent on departments to come forward with new ideas as to how they can use this, how they can partner with, with the private sector, and perhaps in the process bring forward major infrastructure projects that would otherwise languish and wait several years before they would get the money that would be so badly needed to get them off the ground. Mr. Dahi Mackay. I appreciate the last and Of course, this is an issue uh, that will be keenly uh, watched upon by many in the, the construction sector. And the Minister would have attended uh, event, uh, an event with me recently where the construction sector did uh, cite some concern about party political interventions uh, in some of our major capital projects, such as the Peace Centre, such as the A5. And of course, today the former finance minister uh, is saying that our local construction companies uh, shouldn't be building wind turbines, uh, which provides jobs in the local local economy. Can I ask the minister what will he do uh, to prevent further party political interventions in major capital projects that create jobs uh, in our local economy? Well, there was, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a fairly major party political intervention in the form of the member's colleague, the member for North Belfast, Mr Kelly, which um, did more damage to the Peace Centre and that project going forward than anything else that anybody else did. Um, so before the, the member wishes to criticise others, he perhaps should look at the actions of some of his own party colleagues in this respect. What will I do to ensure that infrastructure projects go forward? I will absolutely do everything that I can to ensure that every single pound of capital money that we receive, whether that be through conventional capital, whether that be through financial transactions capital, whether that be as a result of um, receipts that we get for selling assets that are un unneeded anymore by the Northern Ireland Executive, make sure that every single pound of that gets out the door, gets on the ground, gets infrastructure projects that we need to boost our economy off the ground and in the process, in the short and medium term, provide a boost to employment in a sector which has suffered very, very badly, as a member will know, throughout the downturn and actually continues to suffer very, very badly. And I hope in the, in the next number of weeks to bring forward not only the October monitoring round paper, which will have, of course, a capital element to it, but the reallocation of money from the A5, which course cannot move forward at this minute in time, and also some of the additional money that we have received from Treasury. And I hope in that paper, uh, and given the members' obvious support for infrastructure investment, I hope that that bodes well for executive approval of that paper from members of his own uh, party. Uh, and as a result of that investment, we will see further boosts for the construction sector and further improvements to infrastructure in Northern Ireland. Call Mr John Dallet. Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for his answer. I am just wondering, as the Minister who holds the purse strings of this Assembly, the boss cat, so to speak, is there any advice or instructions he can give to departments to ensure that the capital projects are, in fact, shovel ready, to use another Minister's expression, and we do not have this embarrassment uh, that money has to be uh, rolled over or indeed lost? I think the, the reference to boss cat shows up the member's age whenever uh, it, it did change, or was it? A, I've nearly almost looked at Mr. Weir for sort of TV trivia and these sorts of things. I think it may have been was it a it may have been a previously called boss cat, or was when it came here it was called top cat or something like that. But I always remember top cat. But I, I'm happy to take either. I have to say, as I label, I'm happy happy for either. Um, the, the, the phrase shovel ready is one that is frequently used and one that, quite honestly, I am not fond of because there are no projects, very, very, very few projects 
uh, if any at all, that would be deemed appropriately deemed as shovel ready. Because whenever you suggest they're shovel ready, that means that they're through procurement and you're literally ready to go. And as a member will appreciate, once you go past procurement and you start letting the contract, you, you are going ahead with it. You can't then pause it because that then gets you into all sorts of, of legal issues and legal problems if you then make a halt to that, that project. So I think, I think the better phrase to use should be procurement ready. Uh, and one thing that, that I am very, very keen to see happen, and again I look forward to the member's support for this, is a, a more um, strategic look at our infrastructure as a region and say what projects are the most important projects that we want to take forward over the next period of time and that we can work those up to a particular level. That may require some investment by the executive and by, by individual departments to get those projects to the stage where they are ready to be procured if in the, sort of the event that we are talking about now where the A5 doesn't go forward or other capital projects don't go forward or Treasury indeed give us actually more capital spend which is the likely direction of travel over the next number of years that we can start hitting buttons on those strategically important schemes and let those go forward. I think there is a requirement for some degree of prioritisation of our capital projects in a way that actually we haven't done over the last number of years. Mr Robin Newton. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, question number four please. With your permission, Deputy Speaker, I, I will answer questions 4 and 14 together. Capital investment or investment in our physical infrastructure is of significant economic importance. This type of investment improves the region's infrastructure, generates long-term returns on investment, and provides employment opportunities in the short to medium term. In regard to the ongoing capital exercise, the Executive will seek to invest appropriately in infrastructure assets, whilst also recognising the importance of other capital spend. The continued skewing of available resources to the capital budget by Her Majesty's Treasury should be viewed positively. The constrained resource position, whilst providing its own particular challenges, has the effect of forcing departments, including my own, to seek further efficiencies and savings. In some ways, the Treasury position is a catalyst for a continued savings agenda that will ensure that government resources are put to optimum use. We of course benefit from the additional capital provided by way of the Barnett formula and we will seek to ensure continued investment in our regional infrastructure. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for that uh, very detailed uh, explanation. I wonder when uh, could the Minister confirm when the outcome of the 2014-15 uh, capital exercise will actually be known? I remember for his question, I alluded to this, this slightly in, in response to Mr Kai's um, question. Um, this, this exercise comes as a result of the failure to proceed with the A5 and also some additional uh, capital money that we have received from Treasury as a result of, of a concerted policy on behalf of, of, of Treasury to change um, away from skew away from resource expenditure to capital expenditure, so that has increased our level of, of capital expenditure. So that then gives us the, the very sort of pleasant problem, I suppose, of having more money to, to spend than we originally thought. Um, uh, my department wrote to other departments over the course of the summer and early autumn and asked for bids to come forward. Um, departments and ministers took it as an opportunity to be cheeky as they frequently do and uh, bid for everything and anything, you know, like a like a, a kid at Christmas wanting everything off the list. Uh, of course, we'll not have enough money to give them everything that they want, but we should be able to give them something of what they want. And I hope that in the, in the coming weeks we get agreement um, from the executive, not just for the 14-15 capital exercise, but also for the October monitoring round. And that will bring some very welcome good news, not just to the Northern Ireland economy, but to the construction sector, which has suffered so badly over the last number of years. Ms Pam Brown. Well, Deputy Speaker, can I also thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, can I ask the Minister to tell us how um, the 2015-16 capital settlement compares with the 2014-15 position on capital? Well, it, it, thank you for that question. And, and it, it compares um, very, very favourably. Um, it isn't as high as it was uh, at the start of the, the downturn and whenever that started to hit public spending in Northern Ireland very badly and, and members will remember that we were, were taking a 40% reduction in capital expenditure in this current budget period and, and that obviously came at a time whenever 
uh, private sector investment in infrastructure completely collapsed and we're now in a position where public spend on capital is now accounting for close to 70% of all capital expenditure in Northern Ireland, which I think shows the, the extent to which particularly private house building and commercial property development has, has collapsed in, in Northern Ireland. Um, but the comparator position that the member asked for is it will be for 15-16 capital available to the Northern Ireland Executive will increase to 1.1% billion pounds. That's an increase of 3.3% um, on our latest 14-15 position and, and significantly will be 31.9% higher uh, than the 14-15 position originally planned for in budget 2011-15. Uh, the executive I suppose, does have the, the discretion to increase that through capital asset sales and, and other mechanisms, but it's certainly better news. It's not as good news as we would like, but it is better news for the next budget year in 15-16 than we were heading into the current budget. Thank you. And uh, that ends questions to final.